What's up, everybody? Matt Kajeski here back again with the Odd Shopper channel. And today we're talking some college football betting ahead of week one, the Saturday slate. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. We are brought to you today by Caesar Sportsbook. Phenomenal offer for you guys. New users can bet $50, and they are going to get $250 in the form of bonus bets. You'll get your first one after that wager settles for $50, and then you'll get $50 each of the subsequent weeks. Those need to be used within seven days of being issued. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. But make sure to take advantage of that. These promos aren't going to, to last forever. Great way to build your bankroll, especially as we head into college football season. All right, week one, Saturday slate. We're, I don't know how many games we're going to talk. I, I just have a list and we're going to get through as many as we can. Rapid fire style. First one I want to speak on is Colorado taking on TCU. I'll try to give you some updated lines. My note sheet is from two days ago. So current line here is 20 and a half in favor of TCU, 64 point spread. I'm seeing TCU juice pretty heavily here which is music to my ears because this actually isn't a game I've bet yet, but it's one I want to look to on the Colorado side. I think we're selling Colorado a little short. They're on the road here. It's a completely new staff. Dion comes in, of course, and it's an entirely new roster. They're up there with Kent State for, you know, like most new players. However, unlike Kent State, Dion and the powers that be have had the ability to pluck players out of the portal that they actually want. So on, on offense in particular, I think this team's going to be pretty good. Shadur Sanders comes over. The biggest question for Shadur is just the jump from FCS to Power 5, especially against TCU. It's pretty good secondary there. But backfield-wise, you're deep here, really deep. Alton McCaskill is questionable for this game. I'm a bit surprised by that. He's about 18 months removed from his ACL, and he's still not fully practicing. Maybe a concern here, but ultimately, they're deep here. They have Cavassier Smoke, Savion Wilkerson. They've got a lot of backs here for this team. So I'm not necessarily sure that McCaskill is the biggest component of the offense. Receiver's good. Elijah Weaver, Jimmy Horn, those are two USF transfers. And when you look at Travis Hunter, he's going to play some on offense. Receiver's pretty deep here. Tarvarish Dawson's there. On the offensive line, biggest question by far for this team. You do have two starters back, surprisingly. And then you get a bunch of transfers. Now, I have a lot of questions about these transfers. Some come over from like Kent State as we saw them pillage the portal, their new OCs, former Kent State head coach. But you look at the defense, you only have one returning starter here. This is the biggest question for me. Ultimately, this Colorado team is a team with a ton of potential. I'm just a little bit concerned about how much they can actually do. With that said, we go to TCU, another team with a bunch of change. New OC, it's Kendall Bryles. New quarterback, Chandler Morris. He actually started over Max Duggan last year. He'll be the new starter this year. You lose your running back, but Amani Bailey, former starter at Louisiana. Some good experience there. Receiver should be pretty good. Sevion Williams is back. You do replace your next four guys, but JoJo Earl comes in from Alabama. John Paul Richardson, OK State. Jack Beck, LSU. Jalen Robinson, Ole Miss. Dylan Wright, Minnesota. Pretty good. Offensive line loses three. You return two. You go to the portal, grab a bunch of guys. I think they're better than Colorado here, but I'm not sure by how much. Defense, you lose Dylan Horton, Terrell Cooper from the line. You lose Trebius Hodges Tomlinson in the secondary, but your secondary is still really good. Josh Newton, Bud Clark, Ish Birdings back from injury. Mark Perry, Miller Bradford, Bradford are there. My concern with TCU is up front. I think that's going to be the biggest concern here. But at the end of the day, this is a lot of points to cover for TCU especially against the Colorado offense, which I think is going to be pretty explosive at times. And if they can put it all together on defense, they might be able to take TCU off the field a couple times. They do have some good players, like Travis Hunter is going to play defense. Cromani McLean's a five-star. Miles Slusher's a pretty good safety nickel from Arkansas. This is not the worst defense, and I don't think people are quite giving it enough credit. So I'm going to take the points here, especially if it gets to 21. Not one on my card yet, but it certainly will be if we get that number. Next one, we'll get to Ball State taken on Kentucky. This is one I have taken. 
Kentucky minus 26. I did lay the points here, 49 and a half total. Ball State is in disarray. They have Lane Hatcher at quarterback. If you've seen Arkansas State play, you know he is no good. He's not mobile. He is negative 144 career rushing yards. They lost their best player, Carson Steele. I don't know if this is coach speak, what this is with the depth chart, but they listed Vaughn Pemberton as a co-starter with Marquez Cooper. That is not going to work. Marquez Cooper was the second highest graded rusher per PFF in the MAC. Vaughn Pemberton is just a guy. If they actually split carries, this is a gross mismanagement of talent, and they should fire somebody. I don't know who's making that decision. You lose basically your top three receivers in Jay Sean Jackson, Johannes Tyler, Ab Amir Abdur Rahim. Tight end, you do two guys back that they play a ton of 12, so that's important here. But then you lose four on the offensive line. I mean, like, this is a disaster on offense. I will say defense should be pretty good for this team, but it's still a MAC defense, and it's not a good one either. They were 71st in total D, they're 105th in pass rush, 83rd in coverage, and now you're facing this Liam Cone led offense. It's the same Kentucky offense from 2021, which put Will Levis on the map. You have Devin Leary coming in at quarterback for Kentucky, Ray Davis from Vanderbilt. Demi Sumo Karngbai is going to be his counterpart in the backfield from NC State. All three of your receivers are back. You lose one starter on the offensive line. That's a good unit. On defense, you're going to be strong again. I have some concerns with the secondary, but I also don't think that this Ball State team has the horses to exploit them. I think this is a blowout, and I don't think people are appropriately waiting this new Kentucky offense. The way they play, they can run up scores on opponents here. Of course, you have to worry about them potentially taking their foot off the gas, not showing a ton, but not worried about that here. We'll back Kentucky and lay the points, minus 26. Another Mac fade, one of my favorites, actually. Wisconsin Buffalo, minus 28, 54 total here. Right away, I'll just say I grabbed this at minus 24 in the middle of the summer, expecting it to be a big mover. Not to pat myself on the back. We're trying to give you actionable bets right now. I think 28 is okay. And Wisconsin's offense is going to look different. They're going to pass more. They're going to spread you out more. They're going to run less. But I still think they're going to run a fair amount. Phil Longo, their new OC, he had a backfield with Javante Williams and Michael Carter once upon a time at North Carolina that had 2,000-yard rushers. This Wisconsin team is built through the line, returned five starters. People are concerned about the scheme change. First of all, I don't think they're going to pass as much as people think. It's not going to be full air raid Wisconsin. It is going to be different, but I mean, it's not going to take a lot to change this offense. They were one of the run heaviest teams in the country. That should help their offensive line. And then plus you get two premier transfers in Jake Renfro and Joe Huber. So if one guy doesn't work, can't make the scheme change, boom, you have players coming in the portal. Seven guys with starting experience for this line that are now going to pave the way for Braylon and Chez. No longer seeing eight man boxes. Love that. In the past game, you bring in Mordecai, proven commodity, somewhat mobile, 3,500 yards at SMU back-to-back -back years. And man, do they have receivers for days. Their top three are back. You bring in Will Pauling, slot receiver from Cincinnati, Bryson Green from OK State. CJ Williams going to be depth, former four-star at USC. This is a good offense, and they're going to ring rattle off points, especially against a Buffalo team. I mean, where do we start? Cole Snyder, 14th graded quarterback in the MAC. That's awful. You have three running backs back. That's solid. The best part of their offense. You lose your top three receivers. You lose two on the offensive line. All the guys you return are below average starters. This Wisconsin front seven is going to eat this Buffalo offensive line. And then on defense, you lost both your edges. You lose one starter at lining back, linebacker, two corners, and one safety. That's a ton of guys you just lost and are now replacing with basically depth pieces. Wisconsin should have a field day, which brings me to the current spread of 28. Maybe in the past, these run-heavy, like, old-school Wisconsin teams couldn't cover 28 points. But even with a more balanced attack, we'll call it, because they, they will run a fair amount. Don't expect, like, a 60% pass rate or something. But a balanced Wisconsin can cover this spread. We'll lay the points with Wisco. Going to our next game, we're going to talk about UTSA Houston, a team where I think we can potentially, or a game, I should say, where I think we can look at a dog, a home dog in Houston. Plus two and a half, 59 and a half total. I'm not sure what to make of UTSA right now. They're losing a lot of production that people don't seem to be factoring in here. Of course, Frank Harris is back. That's the biggest factor in the game. But two of the top three receivers are gone while one's injured and one is gone. Jakari Franklin is at Ole Miss. I don't know if we're going to see 
any like I, I think we're probably just going to see Joshua Cephas. Like Decorian Clark is the game time decision with like an ACL injury. I don't think he's going to play. Which leaves one of the top three receivers from last year. Maybe they fall back on the offensive line. You've got a lot of returners here because this team was so hurt last year. Like seven guys have experience, but not a single one of them had an above average PFF grade aside from Makai Hart. I don't know if your run game is really going to stack up against Houston, who returns all their D tackles and they return one edge. So, I mean, it's a pretty good defensive line for Houston. I don't want to run into that. The secondary is where I think you really want to exploit Houston this year. And with just one of those receivers back, I'm not sure. Frank Harris, luckily, is very, very mobile himself. So that does help them. But the Houston side, you lose your OC. They internally promoted. I don't think that matters a lot. You're going to probably have your head coach calling plays. They haven't announced. You lose Clayton Toon, but you add Donovan Smith from Texas Tech. Mostly a lateral move, lateral move maybe a slight downgrade. Tony Mathis comes in to bolster Stacey Sneed and Brandon Campbell. Deep running back room. Receivers are questioned, losing Tank Dell and Keyshawn Carter. But you have Matthew Golden, former four-star. You add a four-star this year. You bring in Joshua Cobbs from Wyoming. Stefan Johnson from OK State. In addition to Man Jack and Samuel Brown returning, that's pretty good. Offensive line is actually solid here. You return four guys with starting experience, two guys that have started in previous years. This unit is deep, and they added transfers. I think they're going to run all over this UTSA defense. And then you go to the Houston defense again. They're kind of built from the interior outward, transfers in the secondary. I think this is a good way to stop UTSA, who I'm a little worried about their, their passing attack and their potency there. So that's going to be... A big edge for for Houston, I think, here. Not to mention this UTSA team. They're losing one edge, one defensive tackle, two starting linebackers. That front seven is going to be vulnerable to Houston's running attack and their offensive line. So we, I bet Houston plus two and a half. I bet them at one and a half to limited options for me in an illegal state. But luckily that two and a half pops, so I re-hit Houston. Next game we'll talk about here. Let's see. South Carolina, North Carolina is on my list next. This is an interesting game. Should be a ton of points. Not one I bet myself. We'll talk about a couple leans now instead of just pure bets. It's the Saturday video, so we want to get a couple extra games in here before we head out. North Carolina changing OCs to Chip Lindsey, but this South Carolina defense is atrocious. So we'll talk about why I lean the owner over, first of all. Last year, South Carolina on defense was 109th. They were 121st against the run, 26th again in the pass rush, and 106th in coverage. Somehow they were 106th in coverage despite having two NFL corners. I'm not sure how that happened, but it is very much the truth. On the edge, they they lose Jordan Birch and Bilbert Evans. They have no returning guys coming back. Jordan Strachan, he leads the way. He was injured last year, so he's potentially a good guy to get back here. The interior is decent, but again, I don't see them being good at in pass rush terms, one this uh, last year they were 26. This year, I think they're taking a significant step back losing those guys. Their coverage was awful, and they're losing two NFL corners. You're facing Drake May. That's going to be a real issue for the South Carolina team. And then on the other side, I mean, like North Carolina's defense is also a mess. You have pretty good skill position players for South Carolina. Rattler's back. He had pretty decent efficiency. He's got to cut down the turnovers. That's the biggest problem with him. PFF had him at 21 big time throws, 22 turnover worthy plays. But Antoine Wells is back. That's that's really good for this team. You bring in Eddie Lewis from Memphis. You have a five star freshman in Nichols Harbor. I think he's going to play a decent amount. Trey Knox comes in at tight end. Offensive line, I think, is going to be decent. Nothing great here. And again, their defense is awful. UNC doesn't play any defense. They were 97th last year, 93rd in run D, 61st in pass rush, 98th in coverage. They lost a bunch of guys to transfer. This screams over to me. It's been shooting up. I'm not sure I can play this current number. It's up from 60, 60 and a half to 64 and a half in some spots. So this is going to be a wait and see. But this is one I would be looking at towards the over if you're extending your betting card. A couple others to touch on quickly. West Virginia, Penn State. We're looking at a 20 point spread here in favor of the Nittany Lions. 50 and a half points. This handicap to me comes down to West Virginia's ability to run the ball. Penn State's going to score. Can West Virginia extend drives, has some offensive success? They're going to have their head coach call in plays this year. They move on from JT Daniels and add Garrett Green as their starting quarterback. This guy has incredible dual threat ability. And CJ Donaldson's back from injury. You also have Justin Johnson, Jalen Anderson. Your stable of backs are all returning. Your offensive line 
has six players with starting experience. And a lot of these guys are pretty good above average starters. So this should be a unit that can run the ball, especially against some of the weaker teams in the Big 12. Penn State's kind of a different animal. You've got I, I, Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson back on the edge. Defensive interior, you do lose P.J. Mustafer, but you do have some pretty solid guys back like Hakeem Beeman, Kaziah Robinson. They'll rotate in. We'll see. I do think West Virginia can extend some drives with a rushing attack. One I'm waiting, hoping to get like a plus 21, so this is a number play for me, but if I were backing this, anyone in this game, it would be West Virginia. Plus 20 over Penn State. Going down my list, uh, one that's been beat to death, Cal, North Texas. We talked about this a lot in betting youths, one of my co-hosts, ben, ben Raz's favorite plays. Cal's a complete mess. You have Sam Jackson taking over at Signal College. Their best player is probably their running back, Jaden Ott. You lose J. Michael Sturdivant. They listed a bunch of scrubs as starters at receiver over like former four stars. Didn't make any sense. Offensive line is atrocious. They lost their best player, Ben Coleman, by a wide margin. Everyone else that projects to start a below average starter per PFF. Defense is a mess here. I mean, last year, 125th in total defense. They had some transfers, but I'm not sure it's enough. Their best player is a linebacker. Going to be pretty difficult against North Texas, I think. Who is undergoing a scheme change overall, but they return four of their top five receivers. Chandler Rogers comes in from Louisiana Monroe. Don't be confused. This was actually a pretty good player, and he has solid mobility. They have their top four running backs returning. Offensive line is a strength for this team. You have four returning starters. You had a couple transfers from pretty good programs like Georgia Tech transfer. I mean, this is not bad. Defense here, question mark for me, but I think they're a little better in the front seven. And that is where Cal's going to try to exploit you. This is a run-based team. So I think North Texas can hang, cover a spread here. At the current line of plus six, I'd probably be looking at money line stuff. North Texas, pretty sharper play earlier in the week. But that'll do it for me today. We'll be back tomorrow talking the Sunday games. We'll talk about all of them. It's a shorter slate. So make sure to check that out. Hit the thumbs up button, subscribe on the way out. And let me know in the comments who you like in these games. I'd love to hear about it. And if you, have, if you have any questions, I'm on Twitter at net underscore Kajeski. Otherwise, we'll see you guys again next time and good luck.